Well, in skeletal dysplasias, um, which are also called osteochondral dysplasias, constitute a group of approximately 450 disorders that affect both bone and cartilage. Osteo meaning bone and chondro meaning cartilage. Okay. Um, there's actually a, a big classification. It happens to be called the nosology and classification of genetic skeletal disorders. And every so often they come out with a new version, if you will. And the newest is the 10th version. And, this, and in this new version, it comprises 461 different diseases that are classified into 42 groups based on clinical findings, radiographic findings, and or molecular phenotypes. Okay. Um, so although the occurrence of each skeletal dysplasia in and of itself may be rare, overall as a group, they account for a significant number of newborns with congenital anomalies. And this is one of the reasons, Angie, why I think that it's an important topic. Yeah. Um, another reason why I think that this is an important topic is that some of the skeletal dysplasias are lethal. And it is very important for our patients um, in terms of counseling and discussing prognosis and recurrence risks. Uh, and, you know, I'll be honest with you, these uh, conditions are often missed. And you'll hear me discuss it a little bit later on, yeah. but most um, uh, patients who are pregnant get their main ultrasound to look for fetal anomalies at 18, 20, 22 weeks. And particularly for non-lethal skeletal dysplasias, often and they are not diagnosed at that time because there are no ultrasound signs at that time. Now, one other final point I want to make about that is um, due to uh, the fact that there is still high perineum mortality with these conditions, and in fact, um, the overall prevalence is, um, is reported to be like nine in a thousand. Um, uh, so again, the important point here is that each individual condition may not be that common, but as a whole, it constitutes an important group that's important. Um, when I lecture on this topic, particularly to maternal fetal medicine fellows, um, the one thing I stress to them um, is distinguishing between a lethal and non-lethal skeletal dysplasia. Now, um, I don't think it's in our scope to talk about those specific um, differences, but when someone is uh, going over an ultrasound where they're concerned about a scheduled dysplasia, in my own mind, I'm also thinking about specific criteria that are making me distinguish whether this is lethal or non-lethal. So if you want to think about it from an algorithm standpoint, that puts us in a whole different ballgame because if a patient is dealing with their baby having a lethal skeletal dysplasia, that's obviously a whole different thing with a whole different type of counseling, prognosis, and continued management for the pregnancy. And so in your time that you've lectured on it, do you think that the, occur the, the occurrence of these conditions is increasing? Well, I, I think that, you know, we, were, we, we talk about the prevalence of skeletal dysplasias is, is somewhere around 2.4, you know, per 10,000 births. And I don't think that there's really a true documented increase in the prevalence, but I think that, Number one, as we heighten our awareness of these conditions, and two, as our ultrasound technology continues to improve, we better be able, we may be better able to diagnose these conditions or at least suspect them. And the reason I say suspect them is that's half the battle because sometimes it is so hard because there are so many of these conditions as I highlighted earlier that it's hard to pinpoint an exact diagnosis, but that isn't always so critical. If you suspect it, you're already in the ballpark, okay? And that's one thing that's very important for that person that's reading that ultrasound and then who's gonna go and counsel that patient. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, one problem with skeletal dysplasias is, particularly for those that are not lethal, is that they escape diagnosis in the standard 18, 20, 22 week fetal anatomical survey. Um, so a nice example of this is achondroplasia, which is the most common uh, skeletal dysplasia, has a prevalence, prevalence of about one in 10,000 births. And it's the one most people are familiar with, uh, you know, what we, what we think of as dwarfism. Um, 
one of the hallmarks of this condition is shortening of the long bones. But again, the problem is that you may not see this shortening of the long bones until the late second or early third trimester. So how do you know if you have a problem when you're not necessarily doing an ultrasound later, in, later on in the pregnancy? Well, sometimes these conditions manifest in other ways that would then prompt you to get an ultrasound, which would then cause you to suspect the condition. An example here is excessive amniotic fluid, polyhydramnios. How might that manifest? Well, when a woman is coming in for her standard prenatal visit, one of the things we do, of course, is we measure the uterus. We call the frontal height measurement. And if that frontal height measurement is larger than, than expected for that particular gestational age, then one has to think about why that would be. And it could be many reasons. The fetus is on the larger side. There actually is too much amniotic fluid. So they'll often refer for an ultrasound. And as a maternal fetal medicine physician, that's one of the most common ways that I would suspect or diagnose achondroplasia. Not from that 20 week ultrasound where I was assessing the fetal anatomy, which is likely going to be normal in that fetus with achondroplasia, but later on when that patient was referred because of that excessive fundal height measurement. Okay. And in that case, I will confirm that there is indeed polyhydramnios but also look at other things like, yes, some of the long bones um, are a little short. Um, one thing I wanna mention, just in terms of making sure that the audience understands mm -hmm. really, really basic and brief here, a few terms that we use when we talk about long bone shortening is when we talk about long bone shortening, we really have a few terms that are used to describe the degree of long bone shortening. So if you hear the term rhizomelic shortening, rhizomelia might refer to a shortening of a proximal limb, such as a humerus or a femur if you're dealing with the leg. And this is something that you would see, for example, in achondroplasia, which is again, the most common non-lethal skeletal dysplasia and overall the most common skeletal dysplasia in general. In contrast to rhizomelia, you may have mesomelia where a middle segment of a limb shows shortened bones. So for example, if you take the arm and you think of the humerus, the two bones in the forearm, the radius and ulna, and then the bones in the hand, mesomelia would imply that it's the middle segment, such as the radius and ulna, which are short. Or for the leg, it would be the bones below the knee, right, the tibia and fibula. Acromelia is just small hands and feet. Now, micromelia is where all the long bones are short. So for a whole limb, you might have the humerus, the radius and ulna, and the hands all, 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 all are, are, are small. And micromelia is very common in lethal skeletal dysplasias and certainly more common. So whenever we see micromelia, we get very concerned about a lethal skeletal dysplasia. Um, just also keep in mind that when we talk about the lethal skeletal dysplasias, the main cause um, of death in these, in these uh, uh, infants is underdevelopment of the lungs, pulmonary hypoplasia. And often many of these fetuses will have a small chest. So you'll see us on ultrasound actually measure the thoracic circumference, the chest circumference. Some people might even do lung volumes and there's all different ways to do this and all different permutations on assessing the chest and the risks of pulmonary hypoplasia. Um, sometimes I get asked, well, what do you mean by a short long bone? Like, what does that really mean? Um, uh, long bones that are less than the fifth percentile, but still kind of within two or three standard deviations of the mean, often still, Angie, have a good likelihood uh, of being either a normal variation or a non-lethal skeletal dysplasia. Now, on the other hand, long bones that are four or even more standard deviations below the mean for that particular uh, time in pregnancy are likely to be associated with a skeletal dysplasia and um, often a, a lethal one, particularly if you have that micromelia like I was talking about where all segments yes. of the limb are shortened. So that's sort of a little bit of a long answer to your question. <laughs> oh, that's okay when it comes to the lethal forms and the one that, that you had just mentioned, uh, what is the average, how long 
does the fetus make it? Yeah, I think that's a really good question, and it, and it's um and it's it's a tough one because I don't think there's a set pattern to that. So let me give you an example with the most common lethal skeletal dysplasia, which is thanatophoric dysplasia. Thanatophore is death bearing in Greek, and often this is something that you will see in the second trimester on the fetal uh, anatomical survey at 20 weeks. Okay. And again, you'll see a really, really small chest. There are two different types. Uh, you might see certain long bones like the femur look like a telephone receiver. And we'll actually call it a telephone receiver femur. That's in thanatophoric dysplasia type one. In thanatophoric dysplasia type two, you'll often see what we call a clebachotl, which is actually a cloverleaf-shaped head. Um, these fetuses will often have something called a trident hand, where there is a space or a separation between the middle and ring fingers. Trident hand, which is something you actually will see in achondroplasia as well, but also in thanatophoric dysplasia. And again, really, really small chest. So most of these uh, fetuses do pass very shortly after birth, and that could be hours to even days, but mostly we're talking about hours or so because of the pulmonary hypoplasia, and there's really nothing that you can do about that. Uh, on occasion, you will have stillbirths as well, too, but it's very hard to predict that. And when you have one of these, it, 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 you, know, it, you know, no parent ever expects to go into a pregnancy expecting that anything is going to be wrong with their fetus, right? Most people think that pregnancy goes well. Um, so the, the, the whole idea of this and first encountering this is such a shock for people that it's really important not only to have good counseling, but you as the practitioner to be a good listener and make sure that the patient has really had a chance as much as she and the rest of the family are able to to process that information as well too so um particularly yeah. with the lethal skeletal dysplasias it's a tough one and is are there any statistics on subsequent births and the likelihood of having another fetus that develops such fetal skeletal dysplasias Sure. So when we talk about things like recurrence risks, yes. what we're really getting into a little bit, of course, is the genetics of skeletal dysplasias. And the genetics of skeletal dysplasias, Angie, is like a topic in and of itself. And in cases where one suspects a skeletal dysplasia, whether it's lethal or not, in an ideal world, it would be good if a genetic counselor can be involved. Now, for many con uh, conditions, um, these conditions represent a disorder of a single gene, okay. where actually there is a change of a certain base pair that results in a change of a protein. And often these occur in what we call a de novo fashion. So that means sporadic, okay. where, they're not, where they're not inherited um, um, uh, from either parent. So a good example, again, is of achondroplasia. Now, achondroplasia is essentially an autosomal dominant new mutation, where new meaning de novo, meaning sporadic, meaning that it was okay. not inherited from the parent. So that's why you could have someone that has achondroplasia, and if their partner has achondroplasia, yeah. then there is a risk of that fetus inheriting both of the mutant genes if both parents have skeletal dysplasia. And that is what we call homozygous achondroplasia, and that's actually lethal, okay? okay? So it really depends on what we're talking about. Um, now, achondroplasia, uh, for example, represents um, a, a condition uh, similar to thanatophoric dysplasia, which we talked about earlier, which was the most common and lethal skeletal dysplasia. Um, and they're both similar in that both of them are due to mutations and what we call the fibroblast growth factor receptor three, that's a mouthful, FGFR3 gene that happens to reside on the short arm of chromosome number four. Now, FGF, FGFR3 mutations are, are known as gain of function mutations um, and, and that they're associated with uh, one or more normal functions of a protein. And the point I'm making is not so much it's important to know FGFR3 mutations, but just that when we suspect these conditions, mm -hmm. 
we will often obtain a targeted gene panel okay. that exists to help with the diagnosis. So for example, if I was concerned about thanatophoric dysplasia, but maybe I wasn't sure, mm -hmm. I would be obtaining an FGFR3 panel, which happens to test for achondroplasia, thanatophoric dysplasia, and it also happens to test for a couple of others, one being hypochondroplasia, and another one just happened to be called SADAN syndrome, S-A-D-D-A-N, which stands for severe achondroplasia, developmental delay, and acanthosis uh, nigrocans. Um, other common uh, skeletal dysplasias, such as type 2 osteogenesis uh, imperfector, which is a perinatal lethal form, where fractures of the long bones and undermineralization of the skull and long bones are a hallmark. Those are due to mutations in another gene that has to do with type 1 collagen. And in, when there's mutations in these genes, there's abnormalities of this collagen. And those genes just happen to be called uh, call A1 uh, uh, and call 1A2. So for example, if you were suspecting that, yes. now sometimes you may order more than one gene panel. Um, so again, you might obtain an osteogenesis and perfecta panel. Uh -huh. now, now keep in mind a couple of points about this that I just want to highlight. When I'm talking about genetic testing for skeletal dysplasias, we're usually talking about um, uh, amniotic fluid that's derived from an amniocentesis. Although uh, you can obtain fetal tissue, um, which can be utilized, say, in the case of a fetal demise. Now, just to add, there is a lot of research going in to being able to help to diagnose a lot of these single gene disorders non-invasively. There's a lot that you've been hearing about cell-free fetal DNA and looking at aneuploidy, things like trisomy 21 and 18, but uh, cell-free fetal DNA, which is essentially looking at mom's blood for a fetal condition, is certainly a non-invasive way for screening for fetal aneuploidy, but there's also um, research going into, can we diagnose these conditions in the fetus non-invasively? Uh, these single gene disorders. We're certainly not there yet. I think that we have a ways to go, and uh, it's certainly not the standard of care. The, the second point I do want to make is that, you know, we've come a long way since the Human Gene Genome Pro Project in characterizing a lot of the genes that result in skeletal dysplasia, but there are still many skeletal dysplasias where the actual gene mutation has not been identified. So it also is not uncommon that you can go through a whole targeted gene panel and still not get an answer. And that's a tough one because it's hard to counsel patients about things like prognosis and recurrence risks when you don't have um, uh, that uh, uh, ability to be able to make the diagnosis because the gene just hasn't, hasn't been identified or there really is no way to test for it. I think we're better than we were quite a while ago when we have identified a lot of the, the genes. So again, I, you know, as we're talking a lot about genetics here, uh, not everyone has the luxury of being able to, um, to uh, be able to have a genetic counselor involved. But if you can, it could be very invaluable in talking to folks about um, certain things like uh, prognosis and recurrence risks. And what about maternal and paternal age? Um, there is certainly um, that's a that's a that's a good question. There has been certainly a link with paternal age, and it depends a little bit about it depends a little bit about how you define uh, advanced paternal age. But you'll hear certain things like age over 45 or 50, maybe increasing the risk for skeletal dysplasias as it does for for other things, and not necessarily uh, so much um, maternal um, as opposed to aneuploidy, which certainly increases with maternal age. Yeah, and um, so this is sort of, this is really more of a, I don't want to say rare, I don't know if that's a, a unique area that needs a specialist, needs specialist involved. So for the general OBGYN practitioner who suspects it, 
or what should they watch for in their patients? Sure, I think that's a, a great question. Well, one, I think it's always important um, to take a good history okay. because I, I mentioned that some uh, uh, of these conditions occur de novo, meaning that they're not inherited, but some of these, particularly some of the mild non-lethal skeletal dysplasias can be familial where actually you might see something and then realize from the family members that may, they may have a similar thing. So, you know, that's, um, uh, that is important. Uh, an example would be a mother who herself has osteogenesis imperfecta, and she'll often have blue sclera, you know, the whites of your eyes are more blue. Um, but that's obviously a non-lethal form because mom has it and she's pregnant now. But that means that the fetus might be at risk for it too. So it's certainly important to take a good history. Um, other things that I think uh, in terms of what uh, OBGYN practitioners and anyone caring for, for, for uh, pregnant women should watch for in their patients is, is in particular patients that have had a history of having a child with a lethal skeletal dysplasia. Of course, if they are pregnant again, they are going to be incredibly anxious. And this is where I would recommend, if possible, that that patient be referred in their next pregnancy to a maternal fetal medicine specialist for their detailed fetal anatomical survey and perhaps another ultrasound after. Now, one thing um, I, I would always say is a lot of pregnancies are unplanned, of course, but sometimes I think preconception counseling could be really nice in terms of um, alleviating at least some anxiety for the patients and kind of getting a uh, mapping out a little bit of a plan um, with the maternal fetal medicine, medicine specialist who can help co-manage the pregnancy yeah. or work with the OBGYN in terms of, okay, when you get pregnant, this is what we need to do in light of this history. And obviously when the generalist is referring that patient to a maternal fetal medicine spe specialist, it's very important for that maternal fetal medicine specialist to be aware of that patient's history. Third, um, as some non-lethal skeletal dysplasias, as I've mentioned, are not apparent at the time of the fetal anatomical survey that we perform uh, at mid-gestation, I think the practitioner should have a very low threshold to order another ultrasound, whether it is the late, in the late second or third trimester, if something comes up. So for example, when we discussed achondroplasia, uh -huh. You may have a fundal height measurement that is either lagging or it might be too um, too too high for that gestational age, and that ultrasound may open up uh, other things that you may not expect. Um, and again, as I as I mentioned, with achondroplasia, the majority of achondroplasia that I have suspected uh -huh. or diagnosed have been in patients that I've seen not at the 20 week ultrasound, but have been referred. I apologize. How do, you, how do we do this then? Are you going to do splices or do I start from the beginning? Yeah, we, or... we edit it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so for uh, certain uh, conditions like achondroplasia, mm -hmm. uh, my experience has been that I don't diagnose or suspect these conditions even until the late second or early third trimester where the patients are sent to me for something else. Um, I think it's also very important for the practitioner to be comfortable with the person that's doing that ultrasound. And if it's a patient uh, uh, that uh, where who has had a history of a skeletal dysplasia, lethal or not lethal, and, that, and they're referring that patient uh, to a maternal fetal medicine specialist specifically for that, that, you know, they should be comfortable um, um, with that person. Um, the final point I want to mention is something I've touched upon before is that if possible, because obviously as a, as a generalist, you're not expected to understand the genetics of, of uh, skeletal dysplasias. And in fact, most maternal fetal medicine docs 
um, because it's such a broad and complicated field with so many conditions and all different modes of inheritance and so many different genes involved. Um, we usually need help from our genetic counselors as well. But for the general practitioner, if, if it's possible to have a genetic counselor involved, whether it's for a, something that's happening in the current pregnancy or if the patient is contemplating another pregnancy, like I mentioned before, for preconception counseling, uh, in addition to or instead of a maternal fetal medicine physician, sometimes seeing a genetic counselor for preconception counseling to discuss things like recurrence risk um, um, would also be good. So that's why it's very important for um, a generalist who's taking care of women of reproductive age, not even if they're pregnant, to keep these things in mind and look at a patient's history and discuss with their patients, hey, are you thinking about having another pregnancy? Would it be helpful for you if maybe a preconception on consultation with a maternal fetal medicine specialist and or a genetic counselor in light of what happened previously to you? And that could be very valuable. Yeah, I think a lot of patients sometimes when they have a when there's a, a, a birth defect that comes out, mm -hmm. I think it's a normal reaction a lot, Angie, for patients to blame themselves, actually. And often they have to realize that it's not their fault. And information is power here. And the more they learn from maternal fetal medicine docs and genetic counselors, um, and those referrals are made, I think it's the better it's it's better for them. And it actually may even alleviate guilt that that they had um, because they blame themselves for something, oh, you know, it's not uncommon to hear, oh, I did this when I was early in pregnancy. Is this why my baby is this way or something like that? Which, you know, it's usually not the case, of course. For folks that do have a child, say, with uh, non-lethal skeletal dysplasias like achondroplasia, there are lots of things on the web for patients to look at um, uh, to help with that. And even, I would say, practitioners can find a lot of information about that as well. I think that's one thing. Um, this is a topic that I like a lot because it really involves the Sherlock Holmes aspect of our, of our field, where you're really being like a sleuth and you're really trying to figure out what is going on. And when I teach, and when I teach this, I, and imagine you're a maternal fetal medicine physician and you're in a very busy clinic and you have a lot of ultrasounds to read, and all of a sudden you come across this, which takes a lot of time because it's often not straightforward. I kind of have a list of like 10 or 11 questions that I have maternal fetal medicine, that I recommend maternal fetal medicine folks go through yes. to help them narrow it down. So for the generalists, keep in mind that this is a, a, tough, uh, a tough field, even for maternal fetal medicine docs, because we don't see it a lot. Um, uh, but again, prompt referral um, and uh, you know, good communication, um, with uh, maternal fetal medicine docs and finding someone that you're comf comfortable with will only help to heighten uh, uh, the patient experience, which of course can be very tough, particularly if we're dealing with a lethal skeletal dysplasia. So it's it's a weird thing to say a little bit. Oh, I love this. I, I love this field when, of course, you know that there's there's certainly a lot of you know heartbreak involved in it too. Uh, but you know the recurrence risk for some of these conditions. Uh -huh. Um, are not necessarily that high. So there's a lot of hope for patients, but patients need to know that. And that's where the value of genetic counselors, particularly in a preconception way, could be very valuable. So they don't all of a sudden think like, oh, I have such a high chance of this happening again.